I'm Draco Self-Important, and I think you should listen to me. Um, today, you're going to listen to me talk about a very complex subject, uh, and because I want to do my best to acknowledge how uh, nuanced a topic it is, I'm, I've selected an example that was one that was very difficult for me to grapple with. Um, I used to describe Tool concerts as like church for me. It was the closest I got to having a spiritual experience. Um, I saw Tool in concert probably half a dozen times, saw Perfect Circle in concert a few times, once even paid to do like a backstage thing. Um, yeah, Maynard came out and was like, you guys got some nice backpacks because we all got these messenger bags. They weren't even fucking backpacks. They were fucking messenger bags because the package was you got to do a wine tasting of the Caduceus uh, wine uh, from Maynard's Vineyard. Um, you got this messenger bag, and you got a poster signed by everyone in the band. Well, this particular incarnation of A Perfect Circle had Jordy White and James Eha. And so, like, th I had the money in hand because I overdid it on student loans because they let you take out way too much money. Way too much at crazy interest rates. It's insane. Uh, I digress. Uh, that's that's my own stupidity there. But, um, you know, so like the, the deal was it was a meet and greet that you were supposed to get and then a wine tasting and then the show. So you go for the meet and greet and it's like probably like 30, 50 people. I don't know. Not a, a huge amount of people. Um, probably 30, you know, like a healthy classroom size. Uh, and we're all standing in a circle and Maynard comes out, tells us all we have cool backpacks uh, and bids us a, a good day. And when we get handed out all the posters, they're already signed by Maynard. They're not signed by anyone else because everyone else comes out and stops individually and talks to each of us for a second while they sign our fucking posters. Be like, yeah, um, James Eha was the best just just to be about that particular topic. Um, that meet and greet was delightful. If only because James Eha is like, he's, I love an artist who is really, really stoked about people who like their art. Like when I met Jonan Vasquez, like he was so sweet. I totally, I, ooh, the fanboy energy. Uh, <laughs> I was like, hi, I love you. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my, my ex-wife had to be like, okay, sweetie, leave the poor man alone now. <laughs> <laughs> drag my ass away uh, you know but like he he drew me a doodle if you look at the banner on my channel page that's from when I met Jonan Vasquez he drew a doodle on my copy of um oh god jelly something my brain is totally spacing it it's up there um it's it's the the it was a jelly fist is it Jelly Fist? I feel like it's Jelly Fist. It's the book that he did with Jenny Goldberg, and he was excited to see it because no one, like, everyone was bringing, like, Invader Zim shit or Johnny the Homicidal Maniac or, you know, shit that was just, like, him. Um, and so I pulled out a deep cut, and so he drew me a little doodle on it, and I, I love it so very much. Um, but at any rate, so, you know, the, the James Eha experience was great, but, like, going into it, uh, the, the rumors always were that Maynard was a fucking dick, um, and the incident that we're going to speak about apparently happened long before, uh, I went to this particular show, because I think this show was, like, 2006 or something, so this, you know, several years after, um, but, you know, the, although the, the, the story we will discuss is, is not, hadn't happened yet, uh, or had happened, but hadn't been in the public yet, um, you know, it was pretty uh, known that he was a fucking asshole. Like, you knew that if you were meeting Maynard, or if you were meeting Trent Reznor, that you were going to be meeting an asshole piece of shit who was probably not going to be very nice to you and doesn't uh, at all care that you give a shit about their art. You know, which, like, I, as a person who makes art for myself, and if you happen to like it, cool. If you don't, also cool. Like, that's not why, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, I get that energy, but on the other hand, like, when people do like my shit, I appreciate that. Because it's like, if you're making actual art and, like, putting your feelings into it, and if someone connects to that, like, I don't know. 
it seems very, very cold, um, which, you know, you can be a cold person. There's no laws against that. And it, very clearly, uh, the, the energy of the, you know, the not having the social battery to deal with fans, like there could be any number of things, right? So like, I was like, eh, whatever, I expected Maynard to be a dick, uh, you know. Um, so, you know, that is all just to say, that in 2018, when this story comes out, it's like, whoa, what now? Um, I believe that I missed it in 2018. I don't think I discovered this shit until like 2020, like, because I just, I don't fucking like read Rolling Stone and shit. And like, I'm not a Twitter boy. And so like, I had no fucking clue. Um, so I may have been, it may have been closer to when it, I, I don't remember when I found this out, but I do remember being like very, very conflicted. And the reason that I felt conflicted is because I believe what this woman is saying, but I also believe that in the year 2000, when this incident happened, uh, consent was a different thing. And I say this as someone who is the age that, that this woman is, I would have been the same age at the same time. Like, literally. And I was going to Tool concerts at that time, like, you know, and standing right up front and, uh, quite frankly, dressing like a hooker. So, <laughs> like, you know, could have been me. I don't I know. I know you're looking at me going, oh my God, now it couldn't have been. You don't know what I look like as a teenager. I was adorable. Uh, <laughs> anyway, some, if, if you are, uh, uh, you know, some people, you might know what I looked like as a teenager. Uh, at least one person that watches my channel, uh, is very intimately familiar with what I looked like as a teenager because we dated. Oh, he, um, yeah. Love the time that I said that I wished his mom was my mom and I got in trouble for it. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I stand by it. She was better. Oh, that's mean. Oh, it doesn't matter. The lady's dead. Mine, not his. At least I don't think so. I feel like he'd have mentioned that at some point. Uh, no, I'm pretty sure she's fine. Um, and anyway, <laughs> hopefully, let, let me, I have no wood to knock on. Let's just knock on my own noggin because everything around me is metal. This bed frame is metal. So like, I got nothing. Um, so much rambling. So we're going to talk about what rape culture is. Um, we're going to dabble in some conversations about consent and we're going to talk specifically about the accusations made in 2018 um, from an anonymous Twitter user called I was 17, he was 36. Um, which is a pretty clear indication of what we're dealing with here, uh, who, you know, very flatly accused him of rape. Uh, and I, we're going to go over the whole account because I think that that's important. And then we're going to discuss his incredibly brief response. Um, and then that was like the end of the, the coverage after that. Um, the, um, the, this Twitter user, as it were, uh, has posted as recently as last month, looks like there was nothing since 2018. And then last month, uh, was like, hi, what the fuck? Because they the perfect circle is on tour again. And I, and I think that this is, um, when she came out with this shit before was another time that they were on tour. And I think that like watching him be like successful and shit, uh, is, you know, probably pretty painful. And so, yeah, I get the lashing out at those points. Um, you know, <clears throat> so let's chat. Um, let's start with, uh, the, the, what the hell is, uh, rape culture to begin with, right? Because it's something that I think changes over time. Um, and I think that if we keep working, it will continue to change in our favor, because I think that this story is an example of something that happened in 2000 versus the way that we see people react to things now 
I feel like there's a little hope, but I also feel like there's some nuance here. Um, so, uh, I am reading from an article in the Harvard Gazette about uh, a Harvard study um, regarding biases in uh, whether or not rape survivors are believed. Um, this is pertinent because whether or not your average person thinks that someone is telling the truth has a great deal to do with whether or not people get prosecuted because people are generally prosecuted by juries. And that's just, you know, your average Joe Schmo. Um, and the culture that we live in, the media, the et cetera, you know, those have an impact on how you see these things. And if you're aware of that impact, you can take it into consideration. Um, I think that acknowledging your own biases because of the culture that you are soaked in uh, is really good in trying to overcome them. And even then you still don't because sometimes you think shit or do, sh you know, but you can't work with shit you don't know. So uh, there will link in the description if I didn't already say that. Uh, the stacked deck known as rape culture is the set of social attributes about sexual assault that leads survivors being treated with skepticism and even hostility while perpetrators are shown empathy and imbued with credibility not conferred on people accused of other crimes like armed robbery. They use armed robbery specifically because they use it in the study as a comparison point. Um, so let's see. Da, 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 da. So the new research finds that rape culture bias is not only real, but shapes how people determine what a believable rape case looks like, who is most likely a rape victim, and in which circumstances rape is less likely to take place. Uh, in a series of experiments, respondents were given certain details about rape cases like survivors, predators, race, survivors, sex, sexual history, a predator's socioeconomic status, and relationship with the survivor, where the crime took place, and what clothing the victim wore. All details known to have potential trigger the four key elements of rape bias, victim blaming, empathizing with predators, assuming the victim's consent, and questioning the victim's credibility. The respondents were asked to determine which cases should be reported to police and how severely predators should be punished, and briefly explain why in this paper that is linked in this article if you'd like to read the whole thing, uh, which was published in Political Behavior. Uh, so... <clears throat> The details provided were not legally relevant and therefore should not have been factored into people's evaluations, but they do, said Schwartz, one of the authors of the paper. The paper's lead, uh, watch me, the paper's lead author and doctoral student in political science at Princeton University. Yeah, I could have just finished reading that. Jesus. People use them to discriminate between and differentiate between cases. Um, so... It's uh, here. I don't want to read this entire article to you because I feel like uh, you're probably big kids who can read or have speech to text apps or text to speech apps, one or the other. So uh, da, 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 da. let's see. After developing a 72 point framework with which to measure bias, they evaluated all newspaper stories about rape in the LexisNexis database published between 2000 and 2013 using machine learning data analysis. They found a correlation between the level of rape bias in a community's news coverage and the incidents of rape reported and prosecuted there, according to the paper co-authored by Zukov, which I'm probably mispronouncing. Correlation is not causation, of course, so the researchers next wanted to know how the public's perceptions of rape generally influenced their views of specific rape cases. Um, so then this is when, you know, they start asking people questions, giving them scenarios. Uh, the researchers found that some types of victims were believed less often than others, and some scenarios were seen as less credible. Details related to consent, such as the victim's sexual history and prior relationship with the predator, and to victim blaming, such as their sex or venue of the rape, most influenced whether people would report a case to police and how harshly respondents believed the rapist should be punished. Um, I mean, 
<clears throat> here comes the part that I was uh, wrong about the the whys and the whos are being judged here. Um, I made assumptions, and uh, apparently I'm not the only one based on how this is written, but uh, this, this is me correcting the comment that I made uh, to Zog earlier today. Cases involving male survivors... <clears throat> were significantly less believed than female ones, while the race of survivors and perpetrators was not influential in the way some might expect, although respondents were 4.7 percentage points likelier to believe black female survivors than white female victims. Despite the controversies surrounding uh, Brock Turner, socioeconomic status was not a factor for respondents, um, but where the rape took place was influential with people by 6% percentage points less likely to report rapes that happened at a party and 17.6 percentage points less likely to seek harsh punishment if the victim and perpetrator knew one another prior to the rape. The case was 11.8 percentage points less likely to be referred to police by the people in the study, obviously. Um, some respondents were asked about factors in the context of armed robbery to test whether such attitudes were crime-related or rape-specific. The researchers were surprised that respondents were so willingly offered their rationales for deciding whether to report a case or how to punish predators. Uh, yeah, it's, it's so to get to the uh, case at hand, as it were, we're gonna um, read the account uh, according to the accuser, as it were. I swear to God, Cat, I don't know why he insists upon torturing me like this. Like, I, I clearly am doing something. Hi, hello, please stop. Ay, 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 ay. Anyway. So uh, we are on the Twitter of uh, I was 17, he was 36. Uh, I'll also be leaving a link to that in the uh, comments. But the, she reposted on April 15th of this year um, with the caption, a reminder for those, who, those of you buying tickets to A Perfect Circle in 2024, Maynard James Keenan raped me when I was 17 and he was 36, and then uh, retweets herself. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to do my uh, best dramatic reading. Not really. Um, I'm going to read this and stop as I go to make any kind of commentary that I feel is necessary. Um, but let me reiterate, I believe what she's saying. I'm not questioning uh, what happened. Um, the conversation that I want to have is about consent and what consent looked like then versus what consent looks like now. And, you know, uh, to get back to the whole rape culture thing, the venue and the yada, 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 right? The, the, the circumstances of this also make people question. Um, because the vast majority of public response to this has been, why did you wait so long? Uh, which that's a thing that happens a lot, especially when we're talking about sexual assault of like children, you know, we're talking about a 17 year old here. Like that's, yeah, that's trauma. You lock that in a box, it takes a long fucking time to unlock that box and say the shit out loud. That's a trauma response. Like that's totally normal. So like, that's not anything that, you know, um, but, you know, we'll, we'll get into my other personal uh, biases in this as we go, but <clears throat> I shall read. Deep breath. I have to anonymously tell this story because I tried to tell it from my real account and couldn't name him directly out of fear, so I deleted the tweets. Here goes. I was 17 and he was 36. I went to see A Perfect Circle and Nine Inch Nails in the year 2000 with my high school boyfriend. I will leave out the city in an attempt to protect myself. We were looking forward to this all year as both of us were really huge fans, teenagers obsessed with great music. We were in the front row and my boyfriend had his arms around me. The band started. Maynard noticed me in the crowd. Not that it matters what I wore, but I was wearing a Nine Inch Nails tank top and baggy cargo pants with flat-soled combat boots. Maynard saw me and threw a water bottle in my direction. The guy next to me caught it. My boyfriend and I laughed and thought that was cool. 
Minutes later, a heavyset blonde white woman came out to meet us. She looked at me and asked, do you want to meet the band? I said, can my boyfriend come with me? The heavyset woman said, I only have one pass. You can meet them now if you want. I told my boyfriend that I'd see him in a few minutes, and then I followed her backstage. She led me to the VIP area, and I never saw her again. Maynard was sitting on a picnic table and was staring at me. Nine Inch Nails hadn't gone on yet, so I thought I had plenty of time to get an autograph and get back to the show and my boyfriend. I didn't have a piece of paper, so I asked Maynard to sign my hand. I was ready to go back with my boyfriend. Nine Inch Nails was starting, and I didn't want to miss it, but Maynard kept chatting. He asked me how old I was. I said, I'm 17. Then he said, I can't talk to you here. Let's go watch a movie. And he pulled me away from everyone onto a tour bus. He led me to a bed in the back on the bus and closed the door. He put on Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. I decided to watch a few minutes and at least have a weird story to tell my boyfriend later. Yes, 17-year-olds can be naive. This is why older men target teenage girls. <clears throat> he started rubbing my neck. At this point, I fell silent. He talked about the film, Johnny Depp, Hunter S. Thompson, while he started taking his pants off. All I could do was sit there, looking at the movie, unable to move. I froze, so I had to move my body into a... So he had to move my body into a missionary position. He pulled off my cargo pants. He forced himself in. There was no attempt at warming up. I mentioned this because this wasn't about sex. This was about raping me as fast as he could. He penetrated my vagina without a condom, moving rapidly while I lay there frozen in a stunned silence. If I sound clinical, it's because it has been a long time and I have tried to push down any sort of fear or shame that comes with a rape. There was no consent made. I was not high. I was clean. He did not seduce me. He forced me, quickly taking advantage of my paralyzed state. It took me years to process his actions. He came all over my torso and didn't wipe me off. There were stains on my tank top when I left. I don't remember the next few minutes, but I do remember this. My boyfriend was waiting for me at the doorway where I had been led. His face was sick with worry. I didn't want to upset him, so I kept it to myself. I'm sure to some this doesn't sound like rape. I'm telling this story because in the year 2000, the conversation about consent was non-existent, at least not at my high school. Statutory rape in this state was 16 and under. Luckily for him, he beat it by a year. It has been 18 years and I'm still working through the trauma of that assault. Me Too and Time's Up have been an eye-opener. I hope that everyone gets a chance to heal. I hope that I can heal. Maybe telling your story is part of the healing process for victims of sexual assault. I kept it in for years because I knew I wasn't going to be believed by the legion of dedicated fans because he chose to not use a condom when he raped me. He also gave me a strain of HPV, which thankfully was not the cancerous type. Later on, I heard from a male friend that he did this in every city, at every show. He preferred underage girls, or as close to underage as he could get. What happened to me likely happened to a lot of underage girls by this same man. Uh, a warning to Maynard James Keenan and all men, leave underage girls alone. Do not take advantage of girls' kindness and trust. She deserves to keep her self-confidence and happiness forever. Uh, and... Um, and then uh, she goes on, uh, I've carried a sense of deep shame from this assault for many years. I thought it was my fault. How could I let him do this to me? But he was 36. I was 17. He knew exactly what he was getting away with. What could I have done differently? My body was paralyzed. Now that I'm approaching the age that Maynard James Keenan was when he assaulted me, the thought of assaulting a 17-year-old is completely unthinkable. Just unthinkable. We have to train men to think of rape as unthinkable as cannibalism. Um, I mean, you know, like, yeah. Uh, okay, so here's the thing. This is where my bias comes in, right? Um, I am literally the same age, so I imagine that my uh, BFE, uh, you know, Appalachian High School uh, did not have the best version of what sex ed was. But the one thing that was drilled into our heads over and over and over again was no means no. 
That's the only thing that was that was the prevailing message. No means no. Uh, and even then, if you got 47 no's and then a yes, that was still OK. Like you, you, the, the asking over and over and over and over again and the pushing and that was all fine. But you just couldn't if 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 she said no, you just, you know, um, but also it's not like people were verbally asking you would just make a move and see if it landed. And if she didn't stop you, you just kept going. Like, that's... And I say you as... I was the person to wit... You know what I'm saying? Like, I... I uh, Hi. Whore. I don't know what to tell you. So, like, for me, this... I was very rarely in situations where I felt uncomfortable as a teenager because I was, you know, uh, with the exception of my first husband, sleeping with other teenagers. Um, and with him, he certainly wasn't pressuring me sexually. He was, oh, 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 so, uh, like, incel and just, wow. Like, man had no fucking clue what was going on. That was all me leading that show. But there was a dude... Um, that I met when I was in middle school and I, he was in high school. Um, I think I was in eighth grade and he was in 10. I do not remember. I think that's where we were. I don't know. Maybe seven. I, I don't fucking remember. Um, no, it had to be an eighth and 10th because then, um, there was a point that we were both in high school together. Um, but, I think, I feel like this may have, because it was the shit that carried on. So like, um, yeah, no, it was definitely because he was 16 when we met. And like, I thought this dude was so fucking cute. And like, he had this like curly blonde hair and these pretty blue eyes. And he was a music nerd and I love a music nerd. And, you know, so like, but super, super flirty, super like, you know, um, I don't remember how we met. I think I like ran into him outside of the high school or something, or I legit, I do not remember how we met. Um, but got his phone number. We started talking. He would like come over to my house when my mom was at work and shit. Um, I remember the first time he came over, he asked to kiss me. He was like, may I kiss you? And I was like, Ooh, that's so, Ooh, it felt very like, um, you know, chivalrous fucking night fucking, you know, um, but then I spent the entire rest of the time that every other time that we would hang out saying no, 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 over and over again, making very clear to him that like, yeah, I like making out with you, but I'm not ready to take a dick. I haven't come to that point in my existence yet. I'm going to need you to fucking cut it out. Like if you want to, you know, uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, cause I could, there, I remember one time specifically that like we're making out and he was like, eh, and I was like, no. And then like, he asked me at one point, do you want me? And I said, yes, not understanding what he was trying. And I'm like, obviously you're on top of me. Like, you know, but we weren't, we were clothed, but yeah. Um, you know, some teenage bullshit, right? And it, it, like, he started like going for his pocket and I'm like, well, what are you doing? He's like condom. And I'm like, whoa, we've already had this conversation today. No, I am not like, no, you can't like, okay, we're, we're done. Like, thank you. And you know, so like at that point it became a situation where I liked the attention. I liked the making, you know, so like I kept doing it and I, we're all just lucky that he didn't push it further than that. I guess he wasn't that kind of a creep. Um, kind of a creep, but not that kind of a creep. <laughs> um, I don't think that, because I think that what we, what he was doing, he thought, and a lot of other dudes would have thought was totally acceptable. And it's like, no, because I made, you know, and if I were a different person, had I, that miscommunication happened and I not went, whoa, no, stop. You know, like, what if I would have frozen? And, you know, the funny thing about that, from my perspective specifically, is that, like, that he ended up being a part of a group of friends um, where, like, I, I 
slept with a bunch of other people in that group of friends, but not him. So, whoops, whoopsies. Uh, yeah. Um, now, I just remember, like, our, we had a mutual friend who was constantly like, why do you give him the time of day? Like, he's, he's, you know, because that was the thing is he didn't want to date me. He just wanted to fuck me. And so I was like, no, no, I haven't fucked anybody with a dick. Like, no. <laughs> I started out with girls, if you're new to the history lesson. Uh, I did the thing that all boys do and try to be straight, except I didn't realize that's what I was doing. <laughs> it's all some shit in retrospect. It's like, oh. Oh. Um, you know, but I, as a 17-year-old, at an A Perfect Circle concert, would have given my proverbial left nut to have been in a situation watching Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas in a tour bus with Maynard with no pants. So, like, there's my bias. Because, you know, me reading this as the, the, the person who, like, also grew up in this culture and, like, you know, I definitely get that she was not able to articulate and advocate for herself. And that's why consent should be enthusiastic if the person that you're about to fuck looks like a deer in the goddamn headlights that's not a yes that's a at the minimum hey babe are you good like can you check in with someone if they're responding to you not at all like at a bare minimum you know enthusiastic consent um and this is not to say that everyone always has to be in the mood in order to consent enthusiastically. There are situations, especially in long-term relationships, where one of you is going to be super fucking jazzed and horny and ready to go, and the other one is going to be like, no thank you. But like, i give you a hand if you want. Uh, you know, it's a kind, loving gesture. It's a favor. But also, you know, it, it's like, shouldn't be required, you know? <laughs> You should be able to jerk your own business if, you know, but who doesn't appreciate a helping hand every once in a while, you know? Um, yeah. So I can definitely see how, um, it would have been, uh, uh you know, like, I can see from the perspective of the person doing the moving around and the fucking, and this is if I'm being incredibly charitable here, because I don't know what his motivations were. Um, I don't know, like, you know, it, it, it certainly sounds like he just used her like a human fleshlight, uh, and that doesn't sound like a fun sexual exchange. It certainly sounds pretty fucking predatory when it's an adult and a 17 year old like literally more than tw or no more than twice her age somewhere in there i'm bad at math yeah more than yes i can't math can't do it um yeah so let me find because i forgot when sending myself uh links here to get the his quote his response quote so let me find that uh, so here it's in this Rolling Stone, Rolling Stone. All right, Rolling Stone article. Let me, because I want to get the full quote because there's like not a whole lot to it. So you know, want to make sure I get it in its entirety. So let me head on. Oh, it's no longer on Twitter. Hmm. Well, can I find the full quote? Let's see. Quote. Uh, uh, uh. Sorry, I'm. I want to. I want to get it correct. Uh, because you know. Uh. Many thanks to those of you who saw right through this despicable false claim that only does damage to the Me Too movement. 
Keenan tweeted, and shame on those of you who perpetuate this destructive clickbait. As for my delusional but unrequired... Delusional, oh my god. Delayed but unrequired response, I had my phone shut off, you should try it. Um, yeah, see, here's the thing. So, remember all that stuff that I said and the benefit of the doubt and the... Um, if he genuinely just did not realize what was happening in the moment, right, that's the sort of thing to be like, hey, I didn't realize that's what was happening. I'm sorry that you were affected like that. That was definitely not what I was trying to do. But instead, uh, we get disgusting false allegation, like, which, you know, maybe it didn't happen. I don't feel like that's the case here because this person isn't like getting anything from this um apparently according to uh more recent tweets uh she did file a police report i don't know what the statute of limitations is on such things and accuses the uh roadie woman whomever that picked her out of the crowd of trafficking her to him um, which, I mean, that does sound a little trafficky to come pick a child out of a crowd, uh, pull them away from the boyfriend, and send them off to go uh, be alone with this grown man. Sounds pretty gross. Um, you know, but, like, here I am trying to, like, dissect this situation. Like, it's you know, and then we get into the, the, the biases, right? Like, well, she was in the fucking tour bus alone with him. Like, yeah, but that doesn't mean that he got consent, you know, like, you know what I mean? And so, and the venue of where it happened has nothing to do legally with, you know, it's, it, yeah, I, I don't know, man. I do wonder how the boyfriend didn't notice that she came out with the, the, come loaded fucking t tank top like I don't, like sweetie you're crusty and you smell really musky why like i that i don't i don't understand how that wasn't or maybe he figured it out and was just like that's maynard's come that's awesome and they just chose to never speak about it and he assumed that it was chill and that they were just having a don't ask don't tell moment maybe i don't know i would love that is the morbid curiosity part of me is going how? How? So for me, it's been incredibly uh, ridiculous and because I live in this like, okay, so do we separate the art from the artist? Is that really a thing? Um, because everyone is horrible. Uh, Gandhi was horrible, for God's sake. So, like, <laughs> you know, uh, it's... Uh, yeah, human beings are heavily flawed and, you know, so, like, I'm getting to a point now that I can, like, tolerate listening to Tool in a Perfect Circle again and I'm starting to, like, enjoy it again, but there was, like, that whole last new Tool album came out and I just couldn't fucking... I couldn't get into it. Like, I tried to listen to it. First of all, I think it sounds so much like 10,000 Days, they just did a copy album, at least from the bit that, I, you know... Um, yeah, so, like, I just, it, I'm like, this just sounds like the last one. I am unimpressed, and also I didn't have the, like, emotional connection because I was like, eh, gross. Um, yeah. I don't know. So, you know, when I say rape culture, I do not mean that there is a cabal of uh, dudes going around, uh, like, uh, hollow man, invisible style, you know, like getting, raping people, getting away with it all. Like the way that these things are investigated, the way that they're prosecuted, the way that they're covered in the media, the way that the general public and therefore your jewelry pool sees it is affected by our culture in a variety of ways. I assumed that there would be more um, weight on like the financial you know, disparity, what have you. Um, and the, the, uh, less likely to believe white women of it all. Um, you know, th there's some, some cultural shit there. Um, because like th there's some, 
real stereotypes about white women lying about sexual assault and lying about being pregnant and or miscarrying. Like that's, that's a thing that I hear stories in my life, like from, oh, and then this, and then then back my end. And like, yeah. The, so that doesn't surprise me a whole lot. And I mean, historically there have been situations where white women have uh, accused, you know, black men of rape for, uh, political, you know, I'm talking like old school origin of KKK days, right? Like historically, historically, um, not to say that that's, you know, not something that could or does, I don't fucking know, but you know, so like that, that doesn't surprise me too much. Like it does, but it makes sense. If that makes sense, like if it's not what I would have expected, I would have expected it to be the other way around. Um, but you know, I, I think that really, uh, we should be way, 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 I don't know, more open about conversations about what consent looks like. And we should be holding people accountable who don't do that. Um, you know, whether for me, and then this is where we get into the cultural bias of it all. I think that if you're looking at his behavior, if this was something that he did last week, I would have a very different opinion than this is something he did 24 years ago because it simply consent was not the fucking same. You know, it's like, uh, being in your thirties and marrying a 15 year old isn't chill now and wasn't really chill 20 years ago, but 20 years before that, you know, you know well, probably, you know, we're talking the fifties, marrying a teenager was still pretty chill. How many fucking, uh, dudes throughout the early 20th century and whatever wars and whatever countries came home with little child brides who were, you know, fucking 15, 14, like, you know, it's, uh, things change, culture changes, people should be held accountable for sure, but I think that expecting someone, I don't know, man, like, if there was a full-on, like, fucking trafficking ring or whatever, but, you know, I, as, as the, you know, like I said, man, like this, this is why we have to have a better understanding of consent. This is why we have to have a better understanding of trauma, because if you have no idea that what you're looking at is a trauma response, you can't respond accordingly. And if you don't get adequate consent, you someone's silent trauma response suddenly you know it is what it is uh there's a huge cultural bias i think that that cultural bias has a lot to do with whether or not prosecutors will even attempt to try these things because they're not they don't take things to court that they don't think that they will win because it's a waste of taxpayer money that's why most crimes go unprosecuted, like of all kinds. They just, usually people get away with crime way more often than they don't. You know, like just, yeah. Like, I, I don't think that everyone's getting caught on the first robbery, you know? Like, I just don't feel like that's a thing that happens. Um, how many unsolved murders are there? You know, like, I don't know. I don't have stats in front of me and I'm not going to go try to find them because clearly I can't Google on the fly today. But I think that in looping back to what brought up this whole rape culture situation in the last video, that uh, a lot of the bias is put on men as predators. That's why men who uh, are the accusers and the victims uh, are more often not believed because it's assumed that only men can do this. And so then that's when we get in the situation of having to corral men away from women and children because of how dangerous they apparently are when like, is, I mean, you know, are men inherently dangerous? 
I would say no. I would say human beings have a wide variety of potential, you know, moral compasses, personality types, behavioral practices. I think that there are probably just as many women uh, who are fucking horrible creeps as there are men. Uh, I just think that, uh, you know, as the the uh, angry cis dudes in my comments will tell you, they are big and strong and can... Uh, yeah, I, I came upon, upon a comment from like two years ago on an old video that I had like either missed or forgotten about or whatever, but someone else commented. And so then I saw it and it was this big, long fucking shit um, where like... They were, uh, said that I would, no matter how long I had been on hormones, I would get my ass kicked by any natural man. And it's like, you don't think there are small men out there, dude? Like, <laughs> first of all, <laughs> uh, no, uh, I, I, I yeah, yeah, so, you know. I think that there's an emboldening in thinking that you are uh, superior physically that uh, makes you more likely to do something that is overtly a physical assault, you know, being able to overpower someone. But like, you know, yet again, if we're getting back to the, the uh, lady in the gym from the previous video, like, I'm pretty sure that lady had boobs. I'm pretty sure that suggests that she's on estrogen. I'm pretty sure that's exactly what all these fucking people want and expect from a trans woman to accept them as a trans woman, because they all claim that they will. They just all claim that she isn't one. Despite the, like, tiny little strappy tank top and the, yeah, no, none of that was a, a feminine presentation at all. Oh, wait. They caught a lady without makeup in a dressing room and she didn't look all dolled up. Crazy. Not that she's required to wear makeup, just to be fucking clear. But, you know, I still stand by. You have no idea what the hell she was going to look like as she walked out of that fucking place. She was in the big beginning steps of the face. If, if shaving is the thing that you are doing, that is, you don't make up and then shave. You don't put the makeup on the hair. Like, unless, unless you're taping down, you know, gluing down your eyebrows and then, then you put makeup on your hair, but that's a different thing. And I don't imagine that's where she was at, whatever. Um, yeah. I think we need to acknowledge cultural biases. I think we need to be uh, super de duper open and reinforcing about what consent is, what consent looks like, especially when having conversations with kids. Uh, no means no is not good enough. If you don't get an enthusiastic hell yeah and a big old fucking grin, then uh, you, you know, you need to put a fucking pause on that and be like, um, are we sure? Because you don't seem very sure. You know? <sighs> yeah, I don't know. I've rambled entirely too much. If you've made it this far, please like and subscribe. Please subscribe. Subscribe, please. Like, you know, I know that all the YouTubers say it, but it's because it's fucking true. Three quarters of you people are not subscribed. Uh, and there are people who are returning watchers who are not subscribed. Why? <laughs> Just hit the button, please. Okay, I'll stop begging now. Um, I think there might be a hate comment roundup coming, um, but I think it'll be more of just a comment roundup because there's some, some, I don't know, not necessarily hate, but I still want to talk about it of it all. But, you know, uh, this one I thought would be good to make a whole thing. Yeah. Hopefully it was entertaining. Uh, oh, I put, I don't think I mentioned it on my community tab. I put up a clip um, from Whitest Kids You Know to like promote this. Um, and I highly recommend you watch the whole skit. Uh, it's pretty hilarious. Um, yeah. I love you. Be safe. Make your choices.